Oh, for heaven's sake, not another Seiko review. Come on, everybody, rage, dislike, hit that dislike button, smash it for old Hugo. <laughs> In my last video, we got a little existential, maybe philosophical even, but I felt I had to get it off my chest. But today, it's back to regular brass tax watch review business with two new for 2024 releases that really give us some insight on the latest trends and possibly the future direction of the entire watch industry design-wise. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the channel. You caught me there eyeing this beautiful new release from Nevada Grinch. And of course, I'll do a wristwatch check. This is the Chrono Sport, a asymmetrical automatic, very compact, 38 millimeters, but wears even smaller because of the lugs there. Gorgeous little thing. And it's related to today's double review because uh, I'm gonna return to this watch in a future video because it's part of a trend I'm seeing, a new era of styles of watches. This definitely falls within that uh, wider pattern. First up to bat is not only this new 39 millimeter version of Alpina's highly overlooked do-it-all sports watch, the Extreme C-Strong, but it's also a new GMT variant. Maybe the best no-brainer decision complication-wise, for this update of a 42 millimeter watch that I reviewed last year. Now, if you missed it, let me break it down for you with some brevity. They still remain perhaps the most underrated entry level luxury Swiss brand with the unique history of pioneering the very first sports watches. During the 1930s, they came up with the simple but visionary spark of genius to create a tough, multi-purpose but still dressy timepiece intended for Swiss mountain climbers. Kind of like how Seiko started their Alpinist line or Rolex with their Explorer. But unlike those massively overhyped workhorses, now beaten into a fine fleshy pate via unsocial media, Alpina did it decades before both of them. Fast forward back to today's future and Alpina lives on, reclaiming this largely forgotten history with yet more aggressively contemporary designs that refreshingly fuse post genta modernism with supremely impressive quality and a segmented 300 meter water resistant construction reminiscent of the triptych cases of former Bremont and heavily dive-inspired elements to enhance visibility. But most crucially, still feeling original by merging it all harmoniously together like some kind of wrist-top Voltron, ready for any action you can chuck at it. So for the bezel, it is a bi-directional bezel because of course this is a GMT. Very, very solid indeed, lines up perfectly. Now if you look close up, you'll see it's a matte and then the raised sections are a nice highly polished. This is ceramic. It kind of meets the uh, the flat sapphire there with anti-reflective coating. So it kind of slopes upward and then we have this uh, cog style edge to it. Very easy to grip. Talking of ergonomic efficiency, I do love that inlay on the screw down crown. I actually think more um, divers should utilize this. Ergonomically speaking, it's so far superior to um, steel. I, d I don't know why, it just, it just is. Goes with the modernist theme here. Minimal, almost Oris Aquis style uh, crown guards and then a little flanking wing, a bit like the Nautilus. So you see it pulls inspiration from so many different places to flank it, or, uh, to give it balance on the opposite side. Really nice detailing there. We have a double push button deployment there. I love how it matches this aggressive angular style. Makes me think of the, uh, the Panzer Mark III. <laughs> 
Now this would not be a truly independent watch review without some negatives. So firstly, one could argue, do we really need yet another integrated strap sports watch? I'm sure it will inspire some yawns in the audience. And also, is it 39 millimeters too little, too late? Another aspect that might raise a few eyebrows is the no frills standard automatic Celita SW330, AKA the AL560 caliber. It's certainly not gonna impress most watch enthusiasts, but they don't call them workhorse movements for nothing. At least servicing, maintenance, and upkeep is not really a worry. And lastly, while those of us, like yours truly, who do know the costs involved, roughly so to speak, in producing something like this, with this grade of materials and level of standards, unfortunately those who don't, however, who are more annoyingly active on keyboards rather than actual experience in Swiss factories, will undoubtedly complain at the price. With brands like Nevada Grenchen, this is my very own F77, uh, the meteorite dial, I actually upgraded to this, the full titanium. This is a grand less, so it just gives you an idea of where it fits into the, uh, the scheme of things value-wise. It has some stiff competition, Alpina. And of course, can you blame me for you know wanting to get this to scratch that Royal Oak itch? But as you see, side to side, this is far more its own thing, far more original. So this is the new Seiko SRP L15, the blacked out third musketeer in a trio of new offerings for 2024 of redesigned samurais. The first was released in 2004 with a second generation in 2017. Now I have to say a quick thank you and shout out to official Seiko AD Moya Fine Jewelers for so generously loaning in this watch so I could make this review. And incidentally, they are where I personally purchased my own Seiko Willard, as they are the best and most trusted watch dealers in the USA. As for the Alpina, that came directly from the brand, so already bonus points because really I could say anything I wanted to and some watchmakers have a real issue with that. If you want to know more, check out my rather controversial last video. But anyway, let's get back to the review at hand. Speaking of the Willard, the Samurai might not have the longest lineage of Seiko divers like the Tuna or 62 Mass and Arnie and so on, but it does conflate some of the best elements of a lot of them. Its genesis was from the brand's big shift into a more neo-brutalist angular style of the 90s, most evidently with the hyper-aggressive and aptly named Monster in 1996. Seiko's emphasis and focus during that decade was to spend the majority of its resources developing the earliest diving computers, resulting in some of their mechanical divers being largely overlooked, and you could argue for good reason too, as many of them were not going to win any beauty pageants, unlike, most notably, the SKX being the main exception. As a response, when the new millennium did finally dawn, the Samurai was intended to change all of that, despite languishing in R&D for many years. But when it finally did land with its sloped lugs and unabashed deliberate coarseness, taking inspiration from the outline and shapes of that quintessentially of Japanese architectural iconography, feudal fortresses. Rather poetic, if you think about it, because it's literally trying to fortify their position, as if to say, we're back and ready for war. When it comes to the spec of the new uh, Mini Samurai here, uh, it's basically the same as before, just changes to the overall scale. But the Samurai always wore small. It, it was never, a, you know, despite looking extremely aggressive, and there's a lot of dial, uh, more so in the original. So I was really surprised at how much even better this one wears, especially being thinner. Very typical 120 click unidirectional bezel from Seiko. And as you'll see, it does actually line up, unlike my own Willard, there we go. I do wish they'd tell you what material this is. I don't think it's ceramic, but it is engraved. I should say we do have drilled lug holes. I can't remember if the older one, uh, the predecessors had drilled lug holes. Do let me know in the comments. Going back to the Alpina, I do wish they'd maintained a dive time bezel. My Luminor doesn't have a, a bezel and that's a diver. You don't have to have a dive time bezel to be a diver, but 
I do wish they'd kept it and then put the markings of the GMT on the inside of the dial because there's a lot of space there. A bit like uh, one of the most underrated Seamasters I ever owned. And that way you can have a dive time bezel because I use my dive time bezel, you know, a hell of a lot. Both latest generations feel like logical evolution. The predecessors, while utterly charming, do feel rather clumsy in comparison, in the same way if you compared us to our own cave-dwelling ancestors. Well, for most of us, that is. The designers, like skilled sculptors, have chipped away at the marble to reveal a more purified, distilled version, resulting in both cases in a cleaner and distinctly modern affair. Take the samurai handset, for example, before blatantly just ripped straight out of a monster, but now, just like the lugs and the markers, they have more sides and complexity. Meanwhile, gone is the waffle or Seamaster-esque wave patterns of the first and second gen in favor of a no-nonsense matte dial. The bezel here thankfully retains the highly ergonomically effective knurling, which is also on the crown, by the way. It's ever so slightly wider than before, and they've achieved this by moving the outer printed hash marks and scale of it inwards on the dial to make way for it. An extremely nifty bit of subtle design that actually takes quite a while to notice. Going back to the Alpina for a second, I really love how cleverly they've used the brand logo as an embossed pattern to give uh, some intricacy to the dial, maybe even a little triangular nod to the tapisserie of AP. And then they've turned their logo upside down for the 12 o'clock marker. Molto figo indeed. In the Samurai bezel, we see a more sci-fi-esque styled font than before, increased in legibility due to the greater scale and makes use of that now wider space. The date has been tucked away and color matched to the main dial, not at the 3, but at the 430, restoring the lines of symmetry to the main markers. Alpina opted to put theirs at the 6, unfortunately sacrificing the ISO status in doing so, but such is the strength of their convictions in the design language. But then again, technically, this is not a diver. This is a sport watch slash traveling GMT slash whatever you want it to be. Back to the Samurai, and I really do adore the clever segmentation of the 3, 6, 9 and 12 markers, as well as the hours to instantly help orientation and split second differentiation between hours and minutes, with always the excellent Lumi Bright. Couldn't find any QC issues, so no negatives there. Uh, the price is surprising. It's uh, listed at around just over 500. Um, are Seiko trying to reconquer that entry level? The Hardlex, yep, still no Sapphire. A lot of people will complain. I personally don't mind. I think Hardlex is pretty uh, strong and um, Seiko do that because obviously it's in-house, it's their own material. But in this day and age of endless derivative AliExpress stuff that has, you know, all the bells and whistles, a very competitive spec, but not the Seiko on the dial. It's a shame. Accuracy wise, you're not getting anything to write home about, but you can easily regulate it yourself. And these are absolute troopers. With regards to the strap, it's just a very cheap silicon strap. You see it there. Look at how much uh, lint and stuff it picks up. Don't mind silicon because it's soft and very malleable and extremely comfortable and somehow feels luxurious, even though it uh, is an absolute lint magnet. Uh, but you know what? If you want to upgrade, do what I did with my Squire here. I just got the Risk County Watch Club FKM far more high quality i love these i just swapped out the buckle you could easily swap out the buckle do what i did i think the waffle would really work on this and just complete the seiko of course i mean it wouldn't be a seiko without uh, <laughs> some corner cut uh, somewhere i mean if you like silicon uh, i wear it on my panerai you know oh one more negative for the alpina obviously you are stuck with this 
strap. This has got to be FKM because it feels so much better quality than the, uh, the Seiko. On the burgundy version of the Samurai, they sadly neglected to match the date wheel to the main dial, slightly ruining it. Once you see it, now you can't unsee it curse. So this blacked out, more tactical version is my pick of the bunch. And perhaps that's also to do with my recent video featuring Ghost Dog. That has made me appreciate this more tooltastic aesthetic. I mean, for a chap who lives by the Hagogori Samurai code, what a better watch to upgrade his Victorinox with, right? In fact, both these watches are so compelling, so nicely matured, unless they are going to be knocked out by another new release in the coming months, most likely they will make it into my top 10 best watches of 2024 video, a format that I annually wrap up the year with. But ultimately what both Alpina and Seiko get right is, aside from the more on-trend compact wearable sizes, is that obviously it translates into a better everyday watch as a result. They also confirm to me the prevalence of a wider trend, one towards modernistic, futuristic inspired looks and away from the neo-vintage inspired style that has oversaturated the industry and dominated it for a decade now. Crucially, they have done this by increasing the comfort, loyalty to each brand's respective identities, while still retaining the core functionality that, after all, makes divers and sport watches the most popular genres of all. If I didn't have the Willard, I'd probably pull the trigger on this. Besides, I already have, where is it? I got my uh, forged carbon squire. You know, a material like titanium, maybe lighter forged carbon like this would have really made sense. I'd be even willing to pay more. And also titanium would have been a nod back to the original Samurai. So what have today's watches in question got to do with my wristwatch shape? Well, I feel this is actually very related to this new retro futurist trend. I think neo vintage is a thing of the past. To a certain degree, Genta kind of kicked it off. Endless integrated 70s inspired dress, uh, not dress watches. I would like it to be dress watches. Sports watches from the PRX to the F77, which I myself uh, own now. It's a mix of new, futurist, modern, contemporary, kind of sci-fi, a little bit of brutalism perhaps in there as well with retro. The difference between neo-vintage is trying to look as if it's from the past, whereas retro-futurist, a data technology, let's be honest, mechanical watches predominantly, that are an antiquated form of technology, but trying to look from the future, if that makes sense. And I think this asymmetrical design, and again, another trend, a micro trend within the trend that I'm seeing, look at the AP, fantastic, not, not, not another Royal Oak. So yeah, it's very in keeping with that. And I'll return to this subject, a dedicated video, maybe next month, something I want to do in the colder months because it's going to take, you know, a few weeks of, of research and writing and analyzing. So I'm going to leave it there. Don't forget to add your comments, your thoughts. Uh, is this trend uh, something you're happy to see? Or perhaps there's trends that I've completely missed that I'm not cognizant of. Do let me know in the comments. I love hearing your feedback also. Love seeing those likes, the best way to support more free and independent content like this. I'll catch you in the next one. Onwards and upwards. Thank you for watching. Ciao.